Hey guys, so this video that I'm recording is going to be for March uh, 10th. So this was, uh, this is a class day that is uh, asynchronous, meaning there is no live class. Um, I'm actually recording this in my house the night before, which was Tuesday night. Um, it's pretty interesting to be home recording. Uh, so if you hear any background noises or my kids saying something, I apologize in advance. I will try to mute myself if I do happen to um, catch anything, but again, I apologize, I'm at home. So um, yesterday we took a quiz over probability um, of simple events. So today we're gonna kind of break down and talk about uh, compound events. So uh, we'll kind of discuss right now in a little bit what a, what a compound event is. Uh, so after this, both. So you should have already done the do now in the folder. Uh, if you haven't, you can go ahead and pause right now and do the do now. Once you finish, come back and re uh, go ahead and play the video again. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and give you directions on what you um, are responsible for today. Uh, again, I am on campus. I am going to be around my uh, school laptop and my other computers. So if you need anything or have any questions about something, uh, please send me a Schoology email or an email to my school uh, email and I'll answer you as quickly as I can. Uh, but yeah, so um, I miss you guys and uh, hope to see you back live on Thursday, uh, March 11th. And we'll be down to a couple more days before we head off to spring break. So I'm excited to get there. I know you guys are as well. All right, so this is our objective for today, we're going to calculate experimental, experimental probability of compound events. And that's what we're going to do for today's class. All right. Uh, go ahead. And at this time, if you have your physical math book with you, go ahead and open it to page 169. If you don't, I also, as always, I have the PDF file in today's folder uh, that is labeled 5.3 experimental probability. And also go ahead and just open that up with Cami, and it's going to be the very first page that you open and load that we're going to start on. Okay, I already have that tab open in or have that uh, PDF file in another tab, and so that's what I'm going to use for uh, this particular uh, recording for today. Okay, um, I forgot my like uh, Mimeo pad thing that I write on during class, I left it at school. Um, so I'm going to be using um, the text boxes. So a lot of things are uh, legible for you guys. So you can read it for, for today, okay? So this is where we're on. We're on lesson 5.3, experimental probability of compound events. Okay, sorry, my sound was making noise, I'm sorry. Okay, so experimental probability of compound events. All right, so let's kind of break down what well, you're probably wondering, well, what's a compound event? So a compound event is an event, and this is where I'm reading right here. Okay, so a compound event is an event that includes two or more simple events, such as flipping a coin and rolling a number cube. So it's doing two simple events at the same time together. So when we were talking about simple events uh, on our last um, quiz, we were either spinning a spinner, we were either picking something out of a bag, we were either choosing a card from a deck, we were either, um, what else do we do? Flipping a coin, you know, it just depends on the event. So we were doing one of those things uh, one at a time, okay? A compound event is doing two or more of those simple events at the same time, okay? And they gave you a good example. So you could be flipping a coin and rolling a number cube or a die at the same time, okay? And a compound event can include events that depend upon each other or are independent. So the event could depend upon the other event or they can just be totally separate things and not even depend upon each other, okay? Events are independent if the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability of another event, such as 
flipping a coin and rolling a number cube. All right, so that's a little bit description about probability, I'm sorry, about compound probability and probability compound events, okay? Uh, we're gonna do this ac explore activity on this first page. And we're gonna answer not all of them because um, uh, we won't be able to get to that part, but at least get me thinking about compound events. All right, so for this particular compound event, we're gonna be doing these two simple events at the same time. So in your head, we're gonna envision flipping a coin and we're gonna be envisioning rolling a number cube, AKA a dice or a die, right? So letter A, here we go. What are possible outcomes for flipping a coin once? So we've talked about outcomes before. So we need to think, what are the outcomes? What's my sample space that we have when we flip a coin, right? So what could it land on? Well, we know a coin is two-sided so it can either land on heads or if it flips the other way, it could land on tails, right? So those are the two outcomes that um, you have when you flip a coin, right? So I'm gonna just bring down my text box, hold on. I'm trying to decide what color I want. I'm probably gonna stick with red because I think it pops. So we could either land on heads uh, or tails, I'm gonna put it or tails, right? because that are the only two outcomes that a coin has, right? Letter B, what are the possible outcomes for rolling a standard number cube once, okay? So we've all seen a die, we've missed, we have seen several questions with number cubes and die. You, you guys had some questions, I think, on your um, quiz from yesterday. So if you roll it, what are the outcomes? How can it land? Well, a die or a number cube are six-sided and they are numbered one through six. So the possible outcomes of us rolling a number cube are the numbers one through six, right? So I'm gonna put that here, one comma, oops, hold on. Sorry, let me, I can make you a little bit bigger. Two comma, three comma, four comma, five comma, and six comma, right? So those are the six outcomes that we have for rolling a standard number cube. Pretty simple. And letter C it says complete the list for all possible outcomes for flipping a coin and rolling a number cube. So they went ahead and I am right here. Just so you know where I'm at, I'm right here. Okay, put a little arrow. So they went ahead and they, um, have this like, listing available. Some of them are there and there are some that are blank. So we have the ones that are there. We have H1, H2, blank, 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 T1, blank, 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 right? All those blanks we need to fill in. Well, they already have H1, H2. Hmm, what could that mean? Well, if we look at this little, I'm trying to get to it, hold on, I don't want text box. If we look at this little like bubble, if you will, it says H1, which is this first one here, would mean that the coin landed on heads and the number cube landed on a one, right? So we flipped the coin, we rolled the number cube and it landed on the heads and a one on the number cube. That is one possible outcome for this compound event, okay? So then H2 would mean that we landed on heads and we rolled a two, right? But remember, we said for rolling on a number cube, we have six possible outcomes. So what are we missing? I'm missing the heads three, heads four, heads five, and the heads six, okay? So I'm actually gonna fill in those four blanks with those, uh, with that outcome. So H3, because that means that it would land on heads and the number three on the number cube. H4, same thing, landing on heads and the number four on the number cube. H5, landing on the heads on the um, number cube five. And then H6, 
landing on heads and is it landed or the number cube landed on the number six, right? So I filled in those four blanks that were there. And now we jump to T1. Well, we're probably thinking, well, why, right? Well, because remember we had, oh darn it. I'll kind of erase the little dots underneath. Okay, I'll leave it like that. So we have, um, we have two possible outcomes with a coin, right? Heads and tails. Well, for the heads, I have already found the possible outcomes for rolling a dice and flipping the coins with the tail with the heads. I'm missing the stuff with the tails, right? So the tails, I still need to, I could essentially land on tails and a one on the number cube, and that's what that T1 means. And I could also land on tails two. We can also land on tails three. We can land on tails four. I'm trying to see if I even if possible. Okay. We can do tails five and tails six, right? So we have those possibilities when we are uh, flipping the coin tail and rolling the number cube and it goes up to six times. Right? So then we filled in our list and it says there are blank possible outcomes for this compound event. Basically, I just need to count how many um, possibilities we actually uh, filled in all together. So I'm going to use, let's see, I'm use my drawing feature. I'm going to use this pretty green and I'm going to put like little dots, right? So we have one outcome, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So for this particular compound event, we actually have 12 possible outcomes for this compound event, okay? So that means I could land on um, 12 different types of combinations or whatever of this compound event, okay? Um, I wanted to do this letter D and E in class, actually flipping a coin and rolling a number two. Uh, if you want, you can pause the video if you happen to have uh, a coin and a die at your house. Um, do it, do the experiment and do it 50 times and use your tally marks to record your results on the table. So let's say, for example, I really wish I had something, but I don't. So let's say I flip my coin and let's say it landed on tails and then I rolled the die and it landed on five. I would just put a little, oh, that's not a tally. I would just put a little, a little line to represent that tally. I put it, I probably wouldn't make it as thick. Well, it's cause it's on here. I would probably make it a lot thinner just cause that's a really thick. Like that, boom, right? And then let's say I did it again and I landed on H3, put another tally, so on and so forth. Do that 50 times and then letter E, which, which event had the greatest experimental probability? Like which one had the most tallies and which one was it? What was that event? And then which one was the least amount of, uh, had the least amount of tallies and which event was that, okay? So letter D and letter E are optional. So here are these, this one and this one are optional in case. If you do happen to have the materials, do the quick experiment, the compound experiment, do it 50 times and then just let me know. I'm interested to see what you guys get, what type of data you guys get and, and, and get from that, okay? All right, so that is basically in a nutshell, compound event uh, or experimental probability of compound events, okay? Um, I'm gonna scroll down now to the next page, so page, 170. So those of us that are visual, I'll type it here. We're going to be on page 170. Next page over. Nothing outrageous. Let me just make it a little bit bigger and bolded. There we go. So, and this one is example one, and we're going to be calculating experimental probability of compound events. The experimental probability of a compound event can be used can be found using recorded data. So, sorry. So if you did that experiment previous with the dice and the coin and rolled it 50 times, you recorded data, right? It said to use tally marks. So you have data from that experiment. Now we're gonna take that data and find some probability. Pretty much is what we're gonna do. So 
here's our real world example, example one. Let me read it right here. I am going to start reading from right here, just so we all know where I'm at. A food trailer serves chicken and records the order size and the sides on their orders as shown in the table. What is the experimental probability that the next order is a three piece is for three pieces and coleslaw? All right. So this particular this kind of breakdown, and then it has a table here at the bottom, right? And I see two pieces, I see three pieces, I see a green salad, macaroni and cheese, french fries, and coleslaw. So this particular food truck, they sell chicken. So this one right here, this two piece and three piece is referring to um, the chicken. I'll put here as best I can with my mouse, sorry. It's not gonna be the best chicken. So that means they sell two pieces of chicken and three pieces of chicken. And it also said that they gave a side. So you can choose or their customers can choose what they want to eat on the side with their chicken. And they have four options, right? You can choose a green salad. They can choose macaroni and cheese. They can choose french fries or they can choose coleslaw. Okay, so those are the, the four options of sides that they have. Okay, so they can choose between two pieces of chicken or three pieces of chicken and up to four sides. They can choose a green salad, mac and cheese, french fries and coleslaw. Now, you're probably wondering like, well, why, why would they do this? Like, what's the, um, what's the point of all this? Well, the good thing is that if they track this type of data, the food truck person who makes like their inventory, who orders their supplies or materials or food, they kind of know which one is the most popular and which one is the least popular, right? So they know which one to order more of. So they make sure they have that available for their customers, right? To buy and they make a profit, they get money. It's all, it's all, that's how they run a business, right? We talked about profit when we were learning about percent increase and decrease, right? You, the name of the game is to make a profit so you can have a business, you can pay your bills, you can pay your employees, things like that. So this is a good way to, um, or a business to run to be able to have this data and be able to make conscious decisions on what to buy and make sure you have stuff in stock for your, your consumers, right? So we are trying to find the experimental probability that the next person that comes up to my food truck is gonna order three pieces of chicken with coleslaw, okay? So when we were discussing regular probability here, I'm going to put probability here. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to abbreviate pieces as PI. And I'm going to do coleslaw CS just because I don't have my pen mechanism. So it looks really bad. But you guys know what that is. So that is three pieces coleslaw, right? We had to create a fraction, right? Um, and uh, we had to create our probability fraction in order to find what that was when we were doing simple events, right? Remember the denominator is always, I'm gonna start using the, the text box because I can't do that. Our denominator is always the total number of outcomes or the sample space, total number of outcomes. And it's not gonna change from the Simple event to the compound event. It's honestly the same thing that you we did, the same type of setup. So the total number of outcomes is your denominator and your um, numerator is basically like, what is it that you are trying to find the probability of, right? So for this one, since we're talking about three pieces of coleslaw, our numerator would be, well, how many three pieces How many three pieces with coleslaw were ordered? Let me make this smaller. I'm trying to get it in one, like, there you go. Okay, so that's basically our setup in our head, right? And we're gonna see that one right now. So step one, find the total number of trials or orders, AKA, the total number of outcomes. 
And what did they do? So they looked at each item or each um, compound event and they saw for two pieces and green salad, someone bought it, 33 customers. There's 33, right? Two pieces and mac and cheese, 22. Two piece and french fries, 52. A coleslaw, two piece and a coleslaw, 35. There it is. Two, three piece and a green salad, 13. There it is. Three piece and mac and cheese, 55. There it is. Three piece and a french fry, 65. There it is. And three piece and coleslaw, 55. And there it is. So they got 330. So that means that they served 330 customers for this it, it data that they recorded, right? Okay, so now we know the total number of outcomes is 330, so that's my denominator. Now I need to find, I'm gonna choose a different color, out of those 330, how many customers or how many orders worth with three pieces and a coleslaw? So I'm gonna have to like match up the three pieces and the coleslaw together to see which one that hit, right? So I'm gonna look for three pieces. Here it is. For sure, it's this, this one of this down here on this row. I need to find coleslaw. Here it is. It's this last one. And where do they meet? Right there. 55. So step two, find the number of orders that are for three pieces and a coleslaw. 55. Awesome. So here we go. Find the experimental probability, kind of what I wrote up here, right? The three piece and the slaw. The numerator is the number of three pieces and the coleslaw over the total number of orders or the total number of outcomes. So this would be 55 divided by 330. And they simplified, right? So they took 55 330s and simplify down to 1 6. So we can say that the experimental probability that the next order is for three pieces and coleslaw is about a one in six chance of that happening. And we already know, we kind of went over how to convert that fraction to a decimal and to a percent. So that's something that you can also look at as well, right? So same, very, 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 very similar to simple events, right? As long as you understand how to get from or how to create that probability fraction, you're gonna be golden, you're gonna be good, and also simplifying, right? Simplifying is gonna be very important as the name of the game, all right? I wanted to look at the your turn at the bottom. So right now, go ahead and pause the video, work on this one right here, problem one, solve it, give me the fraction simplified, Play the video. I'm gonna explain. You're gonna to check to see if your answer is right. Okay. So again, at this time, go ahead and pause. Work on number one. Do it on your book or on the PDF file. Give me the fraction. Come back and check. All right. All right. So at this time, you uh, had some time to work on the your turn number one. Usually we would do this in class live, but it's asynchronous, so you're kind of on your own. So here's the your turn question. I'm gonna read it, we're gonna solve it, we're gonna look at it. Drink sales for an afternoon at the school carnival were recorded in the table. And here's our situation. What is the experimental probability that the next drink is a small coffee? Perfect. All right, so I'm gonna put here Probability is a small, sorry, I guys, I'm so sorry. I know that it's gonna take me a while. I'm using my mouse. I don't have my pin mechanism. Small coffee. Ooh, how ugly. So, okay, okay. So there's my fraction. Um, first of all, how many total orders or how many drinks were ordered? Well, you know what, before I do that, let's break down the, the chart, the table. I see small and large. So that means they offer two different sizes. So you went up to this table or whatever, wherever they're selling the drinks and they only offered small drinks and 
large drinks and that's it, okay? And they offered three types of drinks. You could get a soda, you could drink some water or you can drink some coffee, all right? So you could get a small soda, a small water, a small coffee or a large soda, a large water or a large coffee. So you had six, six outcomes to choose from, right? You had six options. And this was what they had observed, okay? So 77 people got small soda, 89 people got a water, small water, 60 people got a small coffee, 68 got a large soda, 45 a large water, and 52 a large coffee. It's important that we now find the total number of outcomes or the total number of trials, our sample space. I need to know how many total orders or how many total drinks they sold at this school carnival. So what does that mean? Just like we did with those um, pieces of chicken, I need to add all the total number of orders to find my total number of outcomes. So that's what I'm gonna put here. I'm gonna do up here, watch. I'm gonna take 77 plus 98 plus 60 plus 68 plus 45 plus 52. And we're gonna add those up. So I should have six numbers because there were six different options. One, two, three, four, five, six. Absolutely, I do. And what do we get when we add up all of those together? I believe the sum is 400. So that's our total number of outcomes. And that's our denominator. I'm going to go back over here and put it here. So 400, right? So they had 400 different orders or 400 different drink orders from this carnival. And I need to look specifically at what? How many ordered a small coffee? So I'm gonna find the small coffee on the graph, on the table. Here's the small, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet them together. Small coffee, coffee's here, perfect, right there. So out of the 400 people or 400 orders of drinks, only 60 were coffee. And I'm gonna put that in my numerator, okay? So there's our fraction. 600, 600, here's our fraction, 60 over 400, okay? As always, we need to simplify this one down because I can, so I'm going to do this one live for you so you can see that it is done. So once we simplify, if you know what, if, if you just got 60, 400 and you didn't simplify, give yourself a pat on the back because you got the correct probability fraction. And remember on your star or on your quiz or on your test, um, it's going to give you the answer simplified. And so you know, ah, my answer is right. I just need to simplify it and just do that. That's easy to do. So we get down to the nitty gritty. Once I simplify, it is three. Okay. I didn't ask for it, but if you wanted to know the I'm going to put the percent as well. So 320s as a percent gives me 15%. So what does that mean? That means we have like a 15% chance that the next order is going to be a small coffee, a really small percentage, not anything outrageous that we might think might happen. But you know what? It might happen. Uh, but it might not happen because of the fact that it's 15%. It's really unlikely, but is it going to be shocking that it happens? No, of course, because they have a 15% chance. All right. So that was in a gist compound uh, experimental probability of compound events and how to find it. Okay. So it's important that um, we kind of set up our fraction um, in, a, in, a, in a good way because that'll give us uh, the leeway or the correct way of simplifying the fraction. All right. So now your job is to work on, that's the wrong one, uh, work on the uh, independent practice that is in today's folder. Um, make sure to also complete and submit the daily attendance, uh, the, the daily exit ticket. Since it's not alive, I can't take attendance at that moment. 
So I'm going to go back and check exit tickets uh, frequently just to update uh, attendance rosters for each class. Um, today is the last day to turn in any missing work Evan, until 11.59 p.m. So if you are failing, please, 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 please get those assignments turned in so I can make adjustments to your grade. And of course, make sure you do work on Alex during math, ELA lab, after school. Um, make sure you get your topics in, right guys? Um, I'm so sorry we couldn't see each other today. I do miss you. Again, if you need anything, send me a Schoology message. Uh, take care. I'll see you all on Thursday. Take it easy, guys. Bye.